Well, good morning. I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 8. And uh, while you're doing that, I just want to remind you about a special event that we're having here tonight. We're going to be having a, a hymn sing um, and prayer time. And uh, I just really think it's going to be a great time. I, in preparing, um, I'm going to be talking about some of the stories behind the hymns. And I got to tell you that I was moved to tears a number of times just preparing these stories um, to see what the saints went through and the suffering that they endured and how they still turn that to praise to the Lord is pretty powerful. So we look forward to tonight worshiping the Lord together and uh, calling upon his name. Well, so far, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has taken us on quite a journey in the book of Romans. It all started out with Paul explaining why we need salvation. In Romans chapter 1, Paul highlights the fact that we are unrighteous, that we worshiped creation instead of the creator. And he also talked about how our sin got everything backwards. Sin gets everything backwards. Instead of men with women, it is now men with men and women with women. Instead of being giving, we are selfish. Instead of being loving, we hate. Instead of being humble, we're proud. Instead of acknowledging God and his existence, we ignore him and act like he's not even there, Romans 1 says. It highlights our unrighteousness in Romans chapter 1. And then in Romans chapter 2, he highlights our self-righteousness. We can be condemned for living a homosexual lifestyle, or we can be condemned for looking down upon others who live a homosexual lifestyle and feeling ourselves to be righteous on the basis that we aren't like that. We can be lost in unrighteousness, like the prodigal son with the prostitutes, or we can be lost in self-righteousness, like the older brother who was angry with the father for not rewarding him for his loyalty to him. It breaks my heart that in my own life, I have plunged headfirst into both ways of being lost. One way was not sufficient for me. I had to have both, of both unrighteousness and self-righteousness, unrighteousness in overindulgence and sensuality and lies and so forth and so on, and self-righteousness in looking down upon others and thinking that I'm better than them. It's a devilish blend of Romans 1 and 2. Thank goodness then in chapters 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul applies the balm of the gospel. In chapter 4, he talks about Abraham and how we are justified, meaning declared innocent, if we admit that the only thing that we bring to this story of salvation is our own sin, and we say that I do not trust in myself to save myself. I don't trust in my own good works. Instead, I trust in Christ's atonement on the cross, his good works, and I am saved by faith alone, Paul highlights in chapter four through Abraham. And then in chapter five, we meet Adam. And we learn that Adam is the firstborn of the first humanity. And we were placed in Adam, the firstborn of the first humanity, but then God took us and he placed us in the new Adam, the firstborn of the new creation, the new humanity, he took us and he placed us in Christ. In the same way that God initially placed us in Adam, he then saves us and places us in Christ, the second Adam. And we learn that not only are we saved by faith, but we're saved by grace alone in Romans chapter five. And then in chapter six and seven, of course, we learn that Paul says this doesn't mean that a we can live however we want. Salvation is completely free. It is not on the basis of our good works, but this doesn't mean that you live however you want. And so in Romans chapter six and seven, he says, listen, it's not even possible for you to do that because you've been freed from sin. And someone who's been freed from sin is not going to live that way consistently throughout their life. 
The Christian life is not smooth sailing as we've been learning. It is a battle. It is a civil war that we have entered into, the inner man versus the outer man, where Christ takes up residency on our inside and sin takes up residency on our outside and they are now at war with one another. And it is agonizing and it is exhausting and the Christian life is great, right? We have the hope of eternal life. The Christian life is wonderful and there is victory and there is power, but there are also defeats. We will win the war. But there are battles that we lose along the way. And uh, sometimes I feel like in the Christian life, like I'm in a Rocky movie. You know, beat up, black and blue eyes, bloodied in the corner. I know I'm going to win. Just like you know Rocky's going to win. You know the guy's going to win when you watch the movie. Because it's a movie. And you know he's going to win. And especially like me, if you've seen the Rocky movies three or four times, you like, I've watched this before, I know he wins. But you're still afraid that maybe he won't. The Christian life is a little bit like that. We know we're going to win. We know there's going to be victory. But yet there's fear. There's exhaustion. There's agony in the battle with our failures, our corruption, and we fall down. And the wise, aged Apostle Paul knows this. He knows this is how we will feel about the Christian life. And I'm convinced that's why he then writes Romans 8. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he floods our hearts and our minds with the glory of the gospel. And because we've been made new creations, God will not condemn us. The Spirit is transforming us The fruit in our lives demonstrate that we have life, as we learned last week. And all of this was made possible by the cross, where Paul says at the beginning of Romans, he bore our sins in his body. And God, of course, destroyed our sin when he destroyed Christ's body, where Christ took the responsibility for our sin on the cross. And so... As we come to Romans 8, 5, the first verse in our passage for today, I'm convinced we often miss what Paul is doing in these verses, and especially in verse 5. I'm convinced. So let me just read it, and I'll explain to you what I mean. Verse 5, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And usually what we do when we read verse 5 is oftentimes we turn it into something to do. Because we love, we love to do. We love sermons with lots of application and lots of doing points because that's easy to understand. And there's something within our nature that just wants to, to do instead of know, instead of believe. And so we come to verses like this and we think, well, i got to set my mind on the things of the Spirit. That's what it's telling me to do. But this is not an exhortation to do. This is a description of who we are. And Paul wants to comfort us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to tell us that this is who you are. You are someone who sets your mind on the things of the Spirit. And that, rest assured, you belong to him because you are someone who does this. In the midst of your Roman 7 agony, the battle that you're in, do not become so overwhelmed, so despondent, let, letting the enemy convince you and condemn you. Take heart. You are not condemned. You are justified. You are not dead. You are alive. You are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. You do not walk according to the flesh, he even says in a few verses later, you walk according to the spirit. It's not a command, he's saying this is who you are. And then here he says, you are not of those who set your mind on the flesh, you set your mind on the Holy Spirit. This is description, not exhortation. Thomas Schreiner in his Romans commentary says this, about verses 5 through 11, they do not constitute an exhortation 
to live according to the Spirit or to fulfill the law. Rather, they describe what is true of the one who has the Spirit. Colin Cruz, in his commentary on Romans, says, what Paul says in chapter 8, verse 5, then, constitutes descriptions of two types of people, those who are according to the flesh and those who are according to the Spirit. His intention, in verse 5, is to describe, not exhort, end quote. Paul is saying, I know that you're not condemned. I know you're not condemned. I know that you have life, and you need to know that you have life, and that you're not condemned. And you know why I know that, he says? Because you walk according to the Spirit. Of course, the word walk is Paul's favorite life for live your life, lifestyle. Your lifestyle is one that accords with the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement, this is the final verse in last week's message, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Do you see that? He's not commanding. He's not exhorting. He's comforting. He's not convicting. He's comforting. He's saying, this is who you are. You are people who walk according to the spirit. And then later he says, you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. He's not commanding them to be in the spirit. They already are in the spirit. So how do we know if we are living according to the spirit? That's a big question to answer. If living according to the Holy Spirit means that we are people who have eternal life, if walking according to the spirit is the same thing as saying, I have no more condemnation anymore, I have life, if that's what it is to live according to the spirit, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we know if we are walking according to the Spirit? How do we know? Well, he answers that in verse 5. Look at what he says in verse 5. For, here's the explanation, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So do you follow the logic? If you are someone who has life, if you are someone who is not condemned, then you are someone who walks according to the Spirit. How do you know if you're a person who walks according to the Spirit? You set your mind on the things of the Spirit. So that's in your outline, that's the first point. Two primary marks of a person whose mind is set on the spirit. Two primary marks. The first one is their minds and hearts are preoccupied with the things of the spirit. Their minds and hearts are preoccupied with the things of the spirit. Paul says, look at your life. What preoccupies your thinking What preoccupies your mind? What do you continually think about? What holds your affection? The words set your mind is one word in the Greek, and that word is phroneo, one word. And it's interesting, this word phroneo, it doesn't actually even mean mind. That's the Greek word nous. This is phroneo. It's... If you are familiar with etymology, which is the study of words, you will know that one word in one language doesn't always have an equivalent in other languages. So if you were to walk into a tribe in the Amazon, they probably wouldn't have a word for for ice cube or air conditioning. They wouldn't have a word for that. And in the same way, we don't really have a word for phaneo, to set your mind. Also consider the word hesed in the Old Testament. The word hesed, of course, is the famous word for uh, God's love. And some translations translate it that way, love, God's love. The NIV comes along and says, well, it should be translated loving kindness. That way there's a little bit of action in there. And then other translations come along and say, you know, it really should be translated covenant faithfulness. 
It's a covenantal word, hesed is. God is being faithful to love you within the covenant. And then other people come along and say, no, we should really just translate it as mercy and grace. And I had one, one professor say one time, we should just translate it as hesed. <laughs> just put the Hebrew word in there and then just, you know, teach people about it. There's no English equivalent for hesed because it's so robust and an amazing word. Well, that's the same with phroneo. But we can still get a strong sense of what the word means. John Stott um, provides a great explanation of this word, phroneo, which means to set your mind. He says this, it is a question of what preoccupies us, what drives us, what engrosses us, how we spend our time, what we expend our mental energies on, what we concentrate on, what we give ourselves to. John Murray, in his commentary, says this about setting your mind. It means to have your mind set on the flesh. To have your mind set on the flesh is to make the flesh's desire the absorbing object of your thought Interest, affection, and purpose. In other words, it's, it's what you think about, it's what drives you in life, it's what dominates your mind and your thinking all the time throughout your day, throughout your life. It's Psalm 1-2. Blessed is the man who meditates on the law day and night. That's phroneo, that's to set your mind. The, the blessed person is the one who sets their mind on the law, meditates on it, thinks about God's word, the things of the spirit, all the time throughout the day. They're thinking about it, not just in the morning, but throughout the day. It dominates their thinking. There's a negative example of phroneo, the actual Greek word is used in Philippians 3.19, where Paul is talking about the enemies of the cross, and he says this about the enemies of the cross, Philippians 3.19. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, meaning their desires, their impure desires, and they glory in their shame, and then he says this, with minds set on earthly things. Minds set, phroneo, same Greek word, on earthly things. That's a negative example of phroneo. Here's a positive example, Colossians 3, 2, where Paul says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind, let heaven, let eternity, let the God who dwells there be the consuming preoccupation of your thinking. You know, people said, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That's ridiculous. You, you, the problem isn't that we're too heavenly minded. The problem is that we're too earthly minded. If, if we were heavenly minded, we would be very earthly good. There's another usage of this word, and it comes in Matthew 16. And Jesus is explaining to his disciples in Matthew 16 that he has to go to Jerusalem, he has to suffer there, and then he has to die, and then rise again. And Peter being Peter, takes Jesus aside and begins rebuking Jesus. What? No, 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 you're not gonna suffer and die. And Jesus says this in verse 23. But he turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. And then listen to what he says. For you are not setting your mind from that o, on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, Peter had a, a theology that was from man not scripture. His mind had been dominated, listen, by a theology from men instead of extracting his theology from the Bible. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know that Peter had been absorbed with the law, the Torah, his whole life, and the writings, and the Psalms, and the prophets. He had been exposed to the word of God 
in the Old Testament his entire life. And yet Jesus said, you have been setting your mind and preoccupying your mind with the teachings of men. A bad theology, a really bad doctrine that went like this. God's gonna send the Messiah to come. And the Messiah is going to give ribbons and trophies to all of us Jews. He's gonna obliterate our evil enemies. And he's gonna wipe out all suffering in our lives. And there's gonna be shalom and peace and blessing and everything's gonna be better. We're gonna get rewarded. They're gonna get destroyed. He's gonna set up his kingdom and there's gonna be no more suffering. Well, for Jesus to say, I'm gonna go and suffer and die at the hands of your enemies, that did not square very well with Peter's theology, which he had been setting his mind on. If he had been setting his mind on scripture, reading the stories of men like Joseph, men like David, he would know that humiliation must precede exaltation. He would know that suffering must precede glory. He would know that the cross must precede the crown. But God's ways were a stumbling block to him because God's ways involve what? Suffering. And we don't like that because our minds are set on the teachings of men of the church today that does not like the way of suffering, that does not like the way of weakness, but weakness is the way, suffering is the way. And so we come to scripture and we're offended, we're scandalized because we're not setting our minds on the things of God, rather we're setting our mind on the things of men. But it's important to understand that setting our mind on the flesh is not only sending, setting our mind on sinful doctrines like Peter did, setting our mind on the flesh and the things of men is not just setting our mind on sinful doctrines and sensual desires. Sometimes we don't set our mind on anything bad. We are consumed and preoccupied with good things, with acceptable things. So I'm not just talking about bad doctrine like we see with Peter. I'm not just talking about sensual desires and all the bad things that we think about. I'm talking about setting our mind on the good things, the acceptable things, sports, politics, hobbies, handling money wisely, Music, children's sports, retirement, performing well at work, these are all good things. But these are the most deceptive things because they're not bad in and of themselves. And so here's the problem. Here's the problem. You have a person who wakes up in the morning and they go downstairs and they turn on the TV and they watch the news while they're getting ready and having breakfast, and they watch the news. Okay. So far, so good. Then they get ready, and they get in their car, and they commute to work for 30 minutes, and they listen to sports talk radio. Not wrong sports talk radio. And they go into work, and they really perform well at their job. They focus on doing that. There's some frustrations there, but they, they work hard. That's good too. And then they come home or they on their commute home, maybe they listen to 30 minutes of music. And then they come home and they spend time with their children, put them to bed. They do maybe an hour of finances and bills, want to handle their money well. They finish the night watching a cooking competition on television. Nothing wrong there. They turn out the lights and go to bed. It's the same thing day after day after day. Do you know what kind of life that is? 
It's evil. It's evil. Because it is utterly devoid of the things of the Spirit. And Paul is saying here, though, don't get me wrong. Paul is saying here, that's not you. That's not who you are to the Roman Scriptures. That's not you. you. You wake up and you read the Word. And you go to church and you listen to what's being said and you're nurtured by the Word in it. You think about it throughout the week. You're in community with people in your church and you talk about the gospel and the things of the Lord and, and you see your lost neighbor and your heart goes out to him. You pray for him. You think of his lostness. You're watching TV and you see how the people of the world are plotting in vain against the Lord and his anointed one. You think of that, how it's, everything is anti-God and anti-Christ. And your conscience is always working. Is this right? Is this wrong? Does this please the Lord? Does this not please the Lord? I've grieved him by doing this. This was wrong. I need to confess that. Bible verses come into your mind. The Spirit is always teaching you, convicting you, comforting you. Paul says if that's you, rest, be encouraged. Your mind is set on the Spirit as opposed to the person who does good things throughout their day but doesn't think about God at all. This is about, think about his ways at all. It's an encouragement to us. If you live that way, thinking about the things of the Lord, you belong to him. And then in verse six, you can look at verse six. He says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And again, it's important to understand what he's doing here. He is not warning He's not warning. He's not saying that if you set your mind on the flesh, you will die, even though that's true. He's not saying that if you set your mind on the spirit, you will have life and peace. Notice the verb tense. It's in the present tense. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, currently. His aim here is not to convict. His aim here is to comfort. Do you live your life Continually thinking of the things of the Spirit, grieving over your sin, reading the Word, filtering everything that you see through a biblical lens. Paul says, is that you? Then take heart. You are not condemned. Be assured, you have life and peace. And don't let your battle with sin and your failures and your falters convince you otherwise. You're going to do that because of the battle that's in you. You are not at peace with your sin. You're at war with your sin. So you will fail. You will falter. But don't let that condemn or make you feel that you are condemned, that you don't have life and peace. No, you have set your mind on the things of the Spirit, and you have life, he's saying. You have life and peace. Christians are like a person who just had life-saving heart surgery. From those who I've talked to who have had heart surgery, when they wake up, it's kind of a brutal experience. And they're just, they, they ache, and they have medicine for that, but still, it's just very uncomfortable, it's very difficult. And, and then you have to be in the hospital for a while and enjoy all the delights of hospital life, which is great, because you get to wear that gown that's never fun. And then there's hospital food. And you're like, last time I ate chocolate pudding, I was seven. What? It's not great. And you just want to go home. You're aching. And you want to go home. That's the Christian. But here's the thing. Even though we're aching... We just had life-saving heart surgery, and we will live. That's kind of what it is to be a Christian. <laughs> it's the battle. It's the bruising between the outer man and the inner man, and apparently, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, the boxing between the two. It's hard, and it aches. And Paul says the very fact, the very fact, that you are a person 
who has your mind set on the things of the Spirit proves you have life. So rejoice. If you're here this morning and you know that that's true of you and you're in the Word and you're, you think about the things of the Lord and you filter everything through a biblical lens, and, but it, if you're not and you never think of God, then repent and believe in Christ. There's a second mark of someone who has their mind set on the things of the Spirit. That's point two in your outline. They are in a reconciled relationship of love with God. People who have their minds set on the things of the Spirit, are in, they are in a reconciled relationship of love with God. Not so with those who have their minds set on the things of the flesh. They hate God. So those who have their minds set on the things of the Spirit love God because they're in a reconciled relationship with him. Those who have their minds set on the things of the flesh hate God. Romans 8, 7. Look at the first part of verse 7. What Paul says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile. Romans 1.30 says that men are, quote, haters of God. Haters of God. Uh, 1 John chapter 1 says that God is light. That's 1 John 1. John 1 says that Jesus is the light. John 3 says, says that men, what? Hate the light. God is light, Jesus is the light. John three, men hate the light. James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God, enmity with God. How do you know if you hate God though? I mean, hatred is an inner disposition of the soul. Hatred and love, that's something that's inside of a person. It's an inner disposition of the soul, hatred is. It oftentimes goes masked. You can't tell that it's there. It's like faith. Faith is an inward thing that we have. It's an inner disposition of the soul, and you don't know if a person has faith just by looking at them. What do you have to look at? Their works. The works demonstrate what's on the inside of the person. Or love. Love is an inner disposition of the soul. How do you know if someone loves you? It's not just by what they say. It's not just by what they claim. It's by their sacrifice for you. Sacrifice proves love. Works prove faith. So what proves hatred of God? It's not what a person says. Someone says, I'm not, I don't hate God. No, you don't go by that. Don't go by the claim. What proves hatred for God is someone who will not obey, won't obey. That's the first point. They won't obey his law. They refuse to obey the law of God. Look at Romans 8, 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. And here's, here's the word for again. He's explaining for it does not submit to God's law. That's the evidence. Anytime you see that word for that Paul is using, he's providing evidence. He's providing an explanation for what was just said. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for. Here's my explanation. Here's my evidence for this. It does not submit to God's law. You can't go by emotions. You can't by, go by claims of a person who says, I don't hate God. You have to look at their life. Are they refusing to submit to God's law? Making submission the great ambition of your life is the mark of the Christian. First John says that people say, I love God but they practice unrighteousness, which proves that they hate God. So you can claim I love God. You can claim I'm not hostile towards God. You can say I don't, but what proves it is your refusal to submit to the law of God, to practice unrighteousness. That's what Paul says here in Romans 8. That's what John says in his first epistle. It's about what you do. It's not about what you say. 
A, neg a negative example of this would be homosexual uh, Christian. Homosexual who claims to be a Christian. And I say, listen, you know, I love God just like you do. And I, I worship at a church. And I worship Christ just like you do. And I, but I'm a homosexual. I'm transgender. And I, I, I'm proud of that. And it's not wrong. And I will live this way. Well, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they claim. What proves that they love God or hate God is what they do in relationship to God's law, not what they say or what they claim. I'm going to read to you a couple experts from an article in the Gospel Coalition. An article entitled, From Gay to Gospel, the fascinating story of Beckett Cook. Quote, 10 years ago, Beckett Cook was a gay man in Hollywood who had achieved great success as a set designer in the fashion industry. He worked with stars and supermodels from Natalie Portman to Claudia Schiffer, traveling the world to design photo shoots for the likes of Vogue magazine and Harper's Bazaar, he attended award shows and parties at the homes of Paris Hilton and Prince. He spent summers swimming in Drew Barrymore's pool. A decade later, Cook has moved on from that life and he doesn't miss it. What changed for Cook? He met Jesus. On a momentous day in September 2009, while drinking coffee with a friend at Intelligentsia, in L.A.'s Silver Lake neighborhood, Cook started chatting with a group of young people sitting at a nearby table, physical Bibles opened in front of them. They were from a church called Reality L.A., and they invited Cook to visit the church. Cook took them up on the invitation, and he visited the church the next Sunday, where he heard the gospel, and he gave his life to Jesus. He never looked back, trading his gay identity for a new identity in Christ. In the years since, Cook completed a degree at Talbot School of Theology and wrote a memoir, a book of his conversion, entitled A Change of Affection, A Gay Man's Incredible Story of Redemption. Later in the article, and I love this, Beckett says this, Quote, when we are regenerated, <laughs> I love that he used that word. When we are regenerated, our affections change. Not just in the area of sexuality, but in everything else. Our attitude toward money, success, relationships. I still struggle with same-sex attraction even though it is greatly diminished and no longer dominates my thought life like it did before God saved me, I'm setting my mind on the things of the Holy Spirit now. You see what dominates your life, your, mind, your mindset? God can do anything, he goes on to say. He created the universe so he can reorient our attractions, and I pray that God would heal the sexual brokenness in me who knows, God may change my desires one day, we'll see, but for now, I'm happy to just be single and celibate for the rest of my life. I'm happy to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus. This is what happens when a person is converted. They now are no longer hostile to God and they love God and as a result of loving God, they now make living in submission to his word the great ambition of their life. But a person who doesn't make submission to his word the great ambition of their lives has no reason to believe that they belong to Christ. Those who have hostility toward God, they don't think the way that Beckett Cook thinks. They don't think this way. They know that the Bible says to love, but they hate. They know that the Bible says to honor your parents, but they don't care. They're just going to disrespect anyway. 
They know that the Bible says to be humble and to humble yourselves through prayer, but they don't pray. They know that the Bible says to lay down your life for your local church, 1 John 3, 16, nope. I can go to church whenever I feel like it, maybe every great once in a while. They don't live in submission to God's word. There's no ambition, there's no drive for that in their lives. Another reason we know that a person is hostile to God, that's the second point there at the end of your outline. Not only they won't obey, they can't obey. They can't. Verses seven and eight. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And then verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I've had a number of counseling situations in my pastorate where person A wants person B to change. And I say, well, is this person... A Christian. Do they love the Lord Jesus Christ? And say, well, no, I, I don't think so, really. And I say to them, well, I gotta tell you, you're expecting life transformation from someone who's dead. They can't obey. You want them to become this whole new person and start treating you much better and live the life of Christ towards you. But they can't do that without the spirit of Christ indwelling them until they're made new creations. And I say that to help you so that you could be patient with them, understanding that they are enslaved. They can't obey the law because they're dead, they're enslaved. And Paul is saying in these verses, listen, and here's the point really, that's not you. That's not you, that's not you guys. This church, Grace Bible Church, that's not You, is that's not your life, that's not how you live. You are able to obey. You don't do it all the time, I don't do it all the time. We're not sinless, we still fall, we still even get angry with God at times and we repent of that, Lord forgive me for my my hard heartedness towards you, right? And, and, And we don't always set our minds on the things of the spirit and we don't always submit to God's law and we don't always love God in the way that we should. But there are moments, plenty of moments of obedience breaking through in our lives because we are able to obey, because the Spirit has set us free. And so what Paul is saying here is be encouraged, be filled with hope. This is you. Your security is not dependent on how well you hold on to Christ, It's dependent on how well Christ holds on to you. Let's pray. Father, we are filled with worship in our hearts. Awe, wonder, love for you because you have set us free. Just like this this man, this Beckett Cook who just, just... The Spirit just said, just did the work. And he walks into the church's service and hears the gospel and and just, yes, yes, this is it. Lord, this is what you did for us here in this room, for all those in this room who are in Christ. This is what you did. You moved in us to draw us to your son and it just made sense whereas those like 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 various philosophers and 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 the Jordan Petersons of the world who who lord just contemplate biblical things all the times throughout their lives but they still don't get it but then you have someone like Beckett Cook and he finds a group of people in a coffee shop and says what's up with this and boom lord we are not saved because of our great minds, our great abilities to understand. We are saved because you came down in power and glory and saved us and set us free by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. May we always be continually thinking 
on the things that please the Spirit. May it be the meditation of our heart day and night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey friend, thank you for letting us be a part of your day. We pray that this sermon has helped you to love Jesus more. As a church, we are on the mission of making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ by teaching everything that Jesus has commanded through the Word of God. So if this resource has blessed you, we ask that you'd share it then with others and follow up with us on our webpage that is found in the description. We look forward to hearing from you and connecting with you soon as we pursue Jesus together.